Uh, we're now moved to uh, session four, our final session. Uh, the uh, presider for this session is Dr. Dan Kowal, Doubleman Assistant Professor of Statistics at Rice. And here he comes. All right, welcome to session four. So again, as before, we'll have two 30-minute uh, talks with question and answers. So our first presenter is Ben Jedlovec. Uh, he is the Senior Director of Baseball Data Quality for Major League Baseball. Prior to that, Ben was President of Baseball Info Solutions, and he co-authored the Fielding Bible versions three and four. Those are the best two versions of the Fielding Bible. Uh, he was also adjunct professor at Lehigh, and most important, he is a Rice alum from the Statistics Department and Kinesiology. Uh, so welcome, Ben, and, and welcome back as well. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me to, to join the conference this year. I know it's uh, something I've looked forward to since we started talking about this over a year ago now. So uh, it's great to have this opportunity virtually. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about our StatCast system at Major League Baseball, uh, subtitled The Next Generation of Baseball Data. So let me share my screen here with you one second. All right, so here we are. Uh, thanks again for having me. I'm going to talk to you today about the history of baseball data uh, then talk to, uh, talk to you a little bit about the pitch tracking era. Um, and then finally, this next generation that we're in now with the StatCast system and everything that, uh, that is related to that. So uh, starting with the history of baseball data, you know, there's a, there's a long history of baseball data here. Um, in fact, probably the longest of any of the sports. Um, it, it goes back to uh, Henry Chadwick in the 1870s inventing scorekeeping and the box score. Uh, over here on the right is one of those first box scores. And uh, it, it's not just you, it does look like a modern box score for the most part. I'll, I'll walk you through this quickly. Um, and you see you have the lineups for both teams laid out here with some data on each one. Uh, you've got T, which just stands for times at bat. So we abbreviated a little bit differently, but otherwise it's the same column you'll see in a box score today on MLB.com or ESPN.com. Uh, R for runs, same column that you'll see in a box score today. 1B for hits or singles, uh, just abbreviated a little bit differently. And in fact, look at this. We have putouts, assists, and errors in, in box scores from the 1870s. You don't even see those in box scores today. Um, you've got you know, your, your line score down here, inning by inning runs. Uh, you've got details about who the umpire was. Uh, it's a little bit cut off here on the side, but, um, and the time of the game. So we have details about baseball games going back you know, 150 years now. Uh, which really makes this a great sport for us to dive into the data and is one of the reasons that, uh, that baseball has advanced as far as it has uh, in terms of sabermetrics and, and advanced analysis. Um, so one thing about these early days is the, the way that players were evaluated at first was based on the number of runs they scored. Uh, interestingly enough, um, you know, probably not the first stat you think of today to evaluate who, who the best players are in the league, but uh, at the time the game was a little bit different and and uh, the, the best players were generally the ones or the ones who were considered the best players, the ones at the top of the runs leaderboard at the end of the year. Uh, that eventually evolved and they started giving out a uh, precursor to the MVP award called the Chalmers Award, where the batting average leader in each league won a car uh, from the Chalmers company. Uh, so this was a hotly contested uh, award for a number of years. And then uh, this was, of course, the dead ball era where uh, batting averages uh, were were very high, relatively speaking, especially for the league leaders. Um, and there wasn't a lot of home run power. So your home run leaders might lead a total of, uh, or have a total of nine home runs, 10 home runs, something in that order, uh, but they might hit 400, 400 at the same time. So those were uh, generally considered, the Ty Cobbs of the world were considered among the best players of the time. Uh, and then of course, uh, by the 1920s, we have Babe Ruth coming in and the Yankees popularizing power and the home run. and and the run batted in. Um, and so you started to see the best players and in fact, the MVP awards when they started being given out um, were given out uh, more often than not to the RBI leader, uh, not necessarily the one with the most home runs or the highest batting average or the highest, uh, any other stat out there. Um, so then in, in the 1950s, you start to see some innovation. Uh, the first one I'll talk about here is Branch Rickey, who you see over on the right with Jackie Robinson, one of uh, one of his uh, claims to fame was uh, signing Jackie Robinson to the first uh, contract and first African-American player to play in the major leagues, of course, uh, in, in the modern times. 
Uh, Branch Rickey is also uh, the father of the modern minor league farm system. So he started with the Cardinals and eventually with the Dodgers and built up uh, a number of farm systems. They would have 20 or 30 minor league teams associated with this. Obviously, a, a far cry from what or far uh, much uh, what we have today is a far cry from that. But uh, eventually, this scaled back and got a little bit more efficient. But that was a way that he and, and his teams uh, cultivated talent and built major league uh, pipeline for major league talent, and then eventually uh, very successful teams in St. Louis and and uh, in Brooklyn and over to L.A. Um, he also hired the first baseball statistician named Alan Roth, who started tracking on base percentage and pitch counts and and, uh, you know, helped those Dodgers. There was a, it was a good uh, Dodgers run from the 40s through the 60s there uh, that was powered by some of this thinking and uh, Alan Roth and Branch Rickey. Um, we also see some others who contribute uh, to um, to the, uh, the the innovation or the beginnings of innovation here. Earnshaw Cook wrote a book called Percentage Baseball. Uh, two brothers, uh, the Mills brothers, developed win probability, the very first version of that. Um, uh, John Thorne and Pete Palmer wrote The Hidden Game of Baseball. Uh, he went on to write The Hidden Game of Football and, and do a number of things, create uh, what we call linear weights uh, as a way of, of comparing players to average and, and adding up the run contributions for individual players over the course of the season. Uh, and then we have Craig Wright, who was the first sabermetrician, as he put it uh, on his business card. Um, the first, he was employed by the Texas Rangers uh, to bring a statistical mindset to their front office. Um, Around that time was when Bill James kind of entered the, entered the picture as well. So Bill James was an outsider of the baseball industry. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with his story, so I won't, uh, I won't get too much into it here, but started self-publishing some books, you know, literally just stapling together a few pieces of, uh, a few pieces of paper and sending them out to a few people who subscribed to his, uh, his newsletter. And eventually that grew, got, a, got an actual publisher and then grew and grew and grew some more. And got picked up pretty widely by the time uh, by the mid 80s late 80s uh, when he stopped publishing this particular publication um, got a lot of national exposure especially from young fans and fantasy players um, this uh, this following that he ended up building here you know kind of one of the things that that bill was successful at was not just talking about baseball with an analytical mindset but writing about it in an entertaining way, entertaining way that drew a lot of fans and built a, a pretty big following. Um, among them were, were John Dewan and Dick Kramer, who uh, co-founded Stats Inc. or kind of refounded Stats Inc. in the 80s and, and uh, took one of Bill's ideas, which was to build a network of scorers around Major League Baseball uh, and collect data, collect play-by-play -play data. Um, they were kind of shut out from being getting access to the official records. So they said, well, we'll just track it ourselves. It can't be that hard. Um, so they went to work and started tracking and collecting a lot of data. So over here on the bottom right, you'll see a picture of like one of the first hit location score, uh, score sheets that they had of the different regions that they would record where the ball went. So you could, if you have a scorer and you could see, um, you know, a line drive land in, in, uh, in zone 4D or something like that, they'd put it in their scorecard and uh, record that. So we had not just play-by-play -play accounts, but also hit locations and, and a, a massive database of information they started collecting uh, back in the mid 80s and then growing into the 90s. Um, eventually, Bill James was hired by the Boston Red Sox in 2002, um, which coincidentally coincides, uh, maybe not coincidentally coincides with the publication of another major turning point milestone in, in the evolution of baseball analytics, the, the publication of Moneyball. Um, I think uh, Moneyball is probably also a book and a concept that uh, most attendees of this conference are, are familiar with. Um, you know, the book chronicled the Oakland A's and, and the general manager, Billy Beans, attempt to compete with the Yankees and the Red Sox despite having a fraction of their payroll. And to do so, he had to do it with some unconventional thinking uh, that was successful, largely based on the, uh, the idea of using data and analytics to make smarter decisions more efficient and cost uh, cost-efficient uh, decisions uh, to build a, a smarter team and, and succeed in ways that the Yankees and the Red Sox weren't able to. So, um, you know, this was a hugely popular book. Michael Lewis, obviously a great author and, and uh, not a one-trick pony either. Um, this brought the baseball data and the idea of analytics and bringing analytics into businesses to, um, to the mainstream and really to other industries as well, from finance and, and all around the world. Uh, and then, of course, there's nothing... Uh, Nothing uh, more helpful to uh, making this a national movement to put 
put a make a movie about it and star Brad Pitt in it. So this, uh, of course, uh, perpetuated or, or grew the uh, the idea of using data to improve baseball teams. And um, back when the book came out, a uh, number of websites, blogs, fantasy publications, you know, they they had been kicking around for a little while, but they just take off. The number of uh, you know, fan graphs and baseball prospectus and, ba and baseball reference and eventually sports reference, you know, the, these sites just take off. There's a, a whole new audience that these books have kind of tapped into and created. Um, major league teams slowly at first start hiring analysts from the outside and bringing this sort of thinking to their teams. And so it's no longer just Oakland or a couple of teams that are thinking analytically, but uh, this grows to the Red Sox with the hiring of Theo Epstein, and then eventually Theo moves on to the Cubs and brings the same mindset there. Uh, Paul De Podesta, who was uh, Billy Bean's lieutenant in Oakland for a while, uh, ended up getting hired as the Dodgers general manager and then working through for a number of different major league teams and, and NFL, an NFL team eventually. Um, and uh, related to all of this, and the number of data and video services explode, really. We have uh, Retro Sheet, which was kind of the successor to the Bill James Project Score Sheet effort, uh, kind of volunteer effort to collect as much data as possible. Um, the Sean Lehman database of uh, baseball data, historical baseball data back to 1871, some of those first box scores. We have season level stats going all the way back that far. Um, a company called Sidex built some, builds a product called Bats that major league teams use, uh, most major league teams use to uh, kind of look at playlists of video and analyze their um, their previous at bats and their upcoming opponents and everything. Um, former company baseball, uh, my former company baseball info solutions is founded in 2002 and, and really takes off a little bit after that. And a uh, similar company called inside edge, uh, had been around before that a little bit, but, uh, but also starts growing their business and working with clubs, working with media and, and more. Uh, and so that brings us into the pitch tracking era here, starting in about 2006. Uh, Major League Baseball rolled out in 2006 the pitch effects system in the postseason uh, and then for the regular season in 2007. And the idea here was to have some cameras that were tracking every pitch uh, around, around the league at all 30 stadiums. So uh, it's reporting pitch speed, break, and location. Um, opens up a lot of doors analytically for the study of these things, uh, studying just pitch speeds and how velocity impacts different things or how how does velocity age? How does velocity trend during a game? Can you can you pick up abnormal trends and kind of make uh, make sense of that and add some value to your team or to your fantasy team? Um, can you look at how uh, can you kind of quantify a pitcher's stuff, quote unquote? Uh, you know how good his curveball is, how much it breaks, how how much movement's on the fastball. Uh, what's the difference between his fastball velocity and his changeup velocity? You know there've been studies, many many studies about all of these things. Um, thanks to this data becoming, uh, you know, being tracked and then being made available as well. Um, and it, it's also enhanced the broadcast experience and just kind of the, the live game uh, ex uh, consumption experience, whether you're uh, watching it on TV or you're watching it on your computer on Major League Baseball's uh, game day app or similar applications where you can see the, the pitch location plotted on the screen there uh, with, you know, corresponding data. You know, when you're on a broadcast these days, you see the pitch location is plotted uh, you know, in a number of different ways. And they have a bunch of different, uh, you know, uh, graphics that they use to, to help you visualize and recap in a bat and, and uh, see exactly where a pitch was and, you know, lets you know what's a strike, what's a ball and kind of highlights how good the, the batters and the umpires really are at telling the strike zone. Um, so this was in 2006, 2007. Uh, a few years later, a company called TrackMan comes along and they start, um, you know, bringing this golf technology they had developed in Denmark and they brought it over to Major League Baseball and they said, well, you know, our radar is pretty good at tracking moving projectiles. Um, a baseball is a moving projectile. Let's see what we can do there. Um, and so they started working with Major League teams in about 2011 and started uh, growing their customer base pretty quickly. They could pick up things like uh, not only just pitch velocity and movement and location, uh, but also pitch spin, which was a new metric that hadn't been quantified as directly before. Um, so you could say that this guy's fastball was spinning at 2,200 revolutions per minute, um, or his curveball was, was approaching 3,000 RPMs. Uh, and these, you know, a whole new set of context and baselines came up there, and you could compare pitchers across each other. You can compare amateur draft picks or draft prospects uh, based on how well their curveball is spinning. 
uh, and compare that and see how that translates to the major league level. Also tracked batted balls for the first time we were getting um, some pretty, pretty comprehensive data on exit velocity, launch angle, and projected distances in ways that we hadn't before. Uh, and so that supplements broadcast, but also makes its way into, uh, in the case of TrackMan with major league teams and how they're evaluating players and, and ultimately how they're training players. Are they, uh, you know, they're finding that uh, maybe a higher launch angle is going to be more successful for a particular batter. You can, uh, that's going to, where he's going to be able to contribute more value given how hard he can hit the ball and how consistently he can hit it at a certain launch angle. Um, and then that brings us to the first generation of the StatCast system, which was putting a few of these pieces together. Um, so the first StatCast system was actually a two vendor solution. It had a TrackMan radar tracking the pitch and the hit, and then also a Chiron Higo camera system tracking the players all around the field. Uh, so you can see here, there's, uh, you know, we can track exactly how far each of these outfielders had to run to get to the landing point of the ball. Um, you could, you know, we, we came up with some metrics at the time, uh, first step, how long, you know, basically measure their reaction time, their top speed, uh, their acceleration. We've come up with new kind of more intuitive metrics for each of these now that, that might make a little bit more sense in context. But, um, you know, this was really groundbreaking where we had, we were tracking uh, almost everything that was going on on the field of play. So that brings us to our, our next generation StatCast system that we just launched here in the past year. And this is a partner, a couple of uh, culmination of a couple of partnerships. One is with uh, Hawkeye Innovations, the UK-based uh, uh, company that's now a part of Sony um, that has been tracking cricket and tennis and soccer for a number of years. In fact, you, you might know them best from, from tennis. Uh, if you watch a tennis match on TV, you can see uh, they've used it for replay for a number of years now to, to um, evaluate whether a ball was in and out of, in or out of the line. Uh, and now they're moving to uh, a live referee situation where they can make those calls in real time. Uh, so you don't even need, especially in a COVID uh, setting, uh, you don't even need line judges in the field, uh, in the, in, on the court at the, at the same time. Uh, you can have the technology make those calls in real time. Um, Hawkeye's actually been a Major League Baseball partner since 2014 when we rolled out our new instant replay system. Uh, which has been a huge success and has gotten a lot, a lot of calls right on a pretty regular basis. And the uh, and Google Cloud is, is a new partner for us as well, a growing partnership uh, that comes in and actually is a pretty good complement to the Hawkeye technology here where we're using them for cloud data and analytics uh, pretty extensively. So this Hawkeye tracking system is 12 cameras, and here's generally where they're placed around the, uh, around the field. Uh, these are all 4K cameras that are tracking pitch, hit, and fielders at all times. And, you know, they're, they're placed in different areas of the field so they can have full field coverage. Um, you know, this is, if you go to a major league ballpark, you can look for these. There's, there's a lot of cameras out there these days. Um, a lot of them are ours between, you know, at major league baseball. Uh, we, we own or, or operate a number of these for broadcasts or for uh, different purposes. But 12 of them around the stadium are going to be these Hawkeye cameras. Um, they, they can be, you know, they look a little different and they might be painted a little bit to, to blend in with the environment a little bit, but generally speaking, they could be mounted in different places. Um, you know, here you've got some on the left, you know, mounted high above, uh, behind home plate above the upper deck here. And they can see, you know, from a high vantage point, everything that's going on and, and with the, uh, quality of these cameras and a pretty good resolution, these cameras are outputting data and I'll come back to that in a second, but. Uh, just a quick note on on the betting front to appease some of you uh, on the on the sports betting side and interested in that. Uh, this data is delivered in real time to clubs and partners such as Sport Radar, who's our uh, our official data partner. Um, our betting feed is in fact powered in part by an automated low latency set of triggers from the Statcast data. So we have a um, basically a data point that as soon as the system detects a pitch being released, it sends us a message and we can relay that on and under 250 milliseconds, you can, uh, you can know that a pitch was released and you can use that to open markets, close markets, et cetera. Uh, a lot of different automated triggers there that is uh, really a great uh, opportunity for, uh, for us and our partners to uh, be able to provide that kind of service, that kind of feed and something that's uh, mostly unique to baseball in that regard. Um, so let me, let me show you a video here. Hopefully this plays uh, without too much stutter. But here is what the Hawkeye camera is seeing in real time. So you see Araldis Chapman going through his motion here to throw a pitch. 
um, and slowed down quite substantially here, but you can see that the, uh, the camera is picking up not just the ball, but also the entire um, torso, the entire pose of, of the pitcher here. Um, it's got the elbow and the knee and the foot and the, the head and the shoulder, you know, everything is kind of pinpointed and they, they're able to re recreate kind of a skeleton of a, a pose tracking uh, for this particular player here. And, uh, and then also pick up that ball coming out of the hand and, and in fact, uh, pick up the release point, even when it comes between frames, they can triangulate between this, the pose tracking data and the ball's trajectory after it comes out of the hand. And they can tell you uh, very precisely within a fraction of an inch where that pitch actually was released and, and let go of the hand. Um, so really cutting edge stuff, even at 100 frames a second, you know, the ball is still moving uh, quite a number of inches here, about six inches, I think it is in, in this particular area, but it can pinpoint the release in between those frames. Um, so uh, a new element from Hawkeye as well was tracking pitch spin. Uh, this was, uh, you know, something the TrackMan radar could do, but um, it's it's a very new cutting edge technology to be able to do this optically. So Hawkeye's got a camera out there in center field that uh, that is picking up the baseball. You can see over here on the right, just kind of some extractions from the individual frames. It can see that baseball, pinpoint exactly where it is, and see not only where the seams are, but it can also read like the MLB logo and the commissioner's signature on the baseball. And so from that, it can derive the orientation of the baseball and from the orientation frame to frame can derive the exact spin rate and the spin axis, you know, what, what, uh, what position the baseball is at at all times and what direction it's revolving, um, which is, uh, is something that our clubs are really excited about because this is gonna help them uh, kind of understand pitch movement a little bit better. There's some new physics research out there about how pitches move, not just due to the spin on the ball, but sometimes just, um, due to the orientation of the ball while it's spinning. So uh, the reason that a, a two-seam fastball and a four-seam fastball can break a little bit differently or different change-ups can break a little bit differently, um, all due to the orientation of the baseball itself, not just the spin rate of the pitch. Um, and so this is the first data we've ever had to be able to describe that and start to uncover that and understand how to train pitchers better to get more movement on their pitches. Um, Obviously, we take accuracy very seriously. So one of the key things with our system, one of the first things we test with the new tracking system is its strike zone accuracy. So how accurate is uh, what the system is telling us compared to where the ball, where um, our ground truth system is telling us the ball is when it crosses the front of home plate. Uh, so we have a set of experts from Washington State University who come in and uh, they use high, very high frame rate cameras, a thousand frames a second or more. Uh, do a lot of manual work to calibrate exactly where the baseball is. You know, we, we throw some baseballs out there, uh, have them go across the plate. They tell us exactly uh, where that baseball is and we compare it to where our tracking system says that it was. And you can see that our original uh, pitch effect system was on the order of maybe plus or minus an inch. You know, from pitch to pitch, it might vary a decent amount um, and it wasn't always centered at zero, zero. Um, our, our TrackMan system that we went to in 2017 was actually not even an improvement off of that. Uh, this was a radar only system at the time. What we went back to TrackMan said we need to do better. And they came forward to their credit. They came forward and said, well, we'll give you a radar plus camera system. So they rolled out a new, uh, what they called TrackMan 2.5 system. And that's indicated with the orange dots here, which you can see we got into within about a half an inch of accuracy in a light, lot tighter cluster of pitches when we did our ground truth testing. Uh, then you go to the Hawkeye system, tested in 2019 and 2020, and, and this is the kind of accuracy we get. We're on average at about 0.15 inches um, of, of error. Um, and the kind of the margin of error here that we're talking about is, is if, the, um, if the center of the baseball was, uh, was the center of this graph, and the, uh, the error on each pitch, the average error on a pitch was drawn in a circle around the center of this graph. Uh, we'd be talking about uh, a circle that has the radius of, a, of an M&M. &M. I mean, we're, we're really precise with our tracking now for something, these cameras being mounted way above the upper deck can get our tracking that, that accurate and, and that precise. It is really uh, quite impressive. And that's what opens up the conversation to uh, not just using this data on broadcast and, and for clubs and entertainment purposes, but 
uh, for things like an automated strike zone. That, that's the kind of conversations that we're allowed, we're, we've been empowered to have at this point. Um, so in terms of tracking completeness, uh, we're basically tracking every pitch out there at this point, four nines of completeness, uh, tracking the spin on every pitch. Uh, our previous system struggled to capture certain batted balls that were moving uh, anti-parallel to the radar. So radar is really good at tracking things moving towards it or away from it, uh, but not things that are moving kind of across its field of vision. So things like pop-ups hit straight up in the air, choppers hit straight down into the ground, um, and then balls hit down the lines are a little bit more of a struggle for it. But our full field coverage of our tracking system here uh, doesn't have that problem. Uh, with an optical system. So we're tracking basically every batted ball out there uh, as well as pickoff attempts. Um, and then here's the fun stuff. Uh, so I mentioned and showed you before how it's tracking uh, kind of the pose of each player on, a, on an 18 point skeleton here. So here was some of the early proof of concept work um, at a spring training park, in fact, where you could see the players and the umpire, you know, they get the umpire out here even running around. You can see that its pose, uh, his, his pose is being picked up, um, you know, pretty well as he's moving around the field uh, as, as well as all the other players. Well, this is data that Hawkeye's begun outputting to us. And some of you who, uh, who might be following us pretty closely might've seen something like this in Moby's field vision. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and play a video here for you. Uh, this is what we're doing with this pose tracking data now. So who climbs I'll, ladders to clean to their gutters? For a second for this, uh, for this uh, advertisement. But um, anyways, we're taking, uh, we're taking this, these, this post tracking, these 18 points, and we're making it uh, kind of a more modern look and feel and an effort to appeal to younger audiences, frankly. Uh, all right, so here we go. So this is NLB's field vision. So here's the original play itself. On the run. Can't make the play. Default later break. Windmill is on. Castellanos throwing towards second. India cuts it off. No, he throws to the plate. The relay attack. He's out. All right, so we got a line drive down the line. Here's what field vision shows you, right? So you use a drone, drone cam, overhead cam to put a, you know, put a perspective uh, really anywhere on the field. See how the players and the routes are running right on the field. The you can put a camera right nice here job. behind the umpire, behind home plate that obviously you couldn't do in uh, in real time. Oh, I might hit the wrong one here. Um, you can, you know, essentially, I think you get the point here that you can put a camera anywhere that you want on the field now, and um, and recreate the play as if you were right there, uh, right right there uh, on the field at the time. So um, this is all, you know, this is where we're going. Uh, we have this really high powered tracking system now that uh, is just generating a ton of data on a regular basis uh, between the video that it's producing and then the data that's being extracted from it. Uh, we're, we're pretty excited about uh, everything that it's got to offer and kind of how it's gonna shape our game going forward, not just kind of making decisions behind the scenes, but you know, the ways that it can improve the game on the field ultimately, so. Um, that's the end of my prepared presentation here. I'll, um, I've got a little bit of time for some questions, if you have any. All right, thank you, Ben. So I'm gonna pull up the question and answer, so please submit those. We have um, plenty of time for Q and A's. So I'll, I'll ask one to start here. So clearly the advanced stats that you guys have are um, of interest to the different teams, but I'm wondering how you use those internally at MLB, uh, and in particular in the context of fair play. Um, living in Houston, we just want to make sure that everyone is playing by the rules and playing fairly. So I'm wondering if this is something with PEDs, sign stealing, uh, spitballs, things like that. How is that being used with the data you're collecting? Um, yeah, it, we use it in any and all of the above, frankly. Um, it's something I think we're, we're getting, uh, we're, we're using more and more on a daily basis here to um, apply it to all sorts of areas of the game. So, um, you know, we're looking at ways that we can make uh, videos more compelling, you know, to put more information. Uh, you know, there's obviously a, a lot of interest, especially among younger fans uh, in video and in data and, and uh, you know, field vision, the product is, has a uh, definite kind of video game feel to it, right? Um, and so ways that we can use this data to just kind of draw in more fans is where we, um, 
is certainly something that we uh, prioritize. But but as you kind of allude, like you know, we can use this data to improve our instant replay system. We can use it to uh, make smart decisions. Um, we're working on a project with Theo Epstein right now where we're evaluating uh, different rule changes that we might want to implement. And we're testing in the Atlantic League and we're testing in, um, in the minor leagues this year, different uh, machinations that, that we might want to ultimately bring to the major league level if we, if we find that they induce the, a, a more exciting style of play. So, um, you know, this, this data is powering any and all of that. Uh, there's, there's, you know, countless applications. So we have a two-part question in the Q&A. The question is, will technology like Trackman actually increase dislike for human officials and umpires to the average viewer? Now that this technology exists beyond the statistical data, does it help umpires get better at calling balls and strikes? Um, you know, I think what this technology has done is really highlighted how good the umpires are um, overall. Uh, they're getting, you know, 90 plus percent. I don't know the exact number of, of calls right on a regular basis. And um, and that's a pretty high standard we hold them to. And I think, in fact, uh, this technology has has only highlighted the, the very small number of calls that uh, that there might be a disagreement in some gray area. Um, but I, I, it's been uh, it's been documented about the you know, it's been a priority for Major League Baseball for a while to help the umpires continue to to do to get better. Uh, and to provide resources for them. So that goes all the way back to the, uh, the Quest Tech system uh, in the early 2000s and then uh, moved on to PitchFX and then ultimately to StatCast where we're, we're using that data and some corresponding video to uh, help uh, you know, show the, give the umpires uh, some, some feedback on a regular basis. And that's been shown to uh, you know, improve their strike zone. In fact, uh, kind of shifted over time to be more consistent from umpire to umpire and, and in align with the, the rules themselves. So um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a huge aspect related to umpiring. There's also a question, a couple questions about Hawkeye data. Um, is, is this a pay service? Is it available to the general public? And then some generic questions about how, it, uh, how it's collected. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be a little bit beyond my depth here about how it works on the tennis side. I can refer you to the, to the folks at Hawkeye, but um, they, they generally have the same kind of setup in tennis as, as we do at MLB, where you can install uh, a Hawkeye system in the venue. And then there's, a, uh, there's an operator who kind of goes through and sets all the calibration of the cameras. And, and then the system just kind of runs itself and it produces the data in that regard. So um, it's... Uh, you know, I, I, they have some products that are targeted a little bit more towards a consumer or a fan or a, or a coach or something like that. Um, but generally, I think they've, they've historically done a lot more at the league level um, and putting these things into, into stadiums uh, as opposed to selling something to a fan off the shelf or something like that. And given some of the advanced technologies you mentioned for balls and strikes, how close do you think we are to automated umpiring or their non-data collection issues that you don't see being overcome? Um, I'm, I'm not going to give you a uh, terribly specific answer on that, unfortunately, but uh, it is something that we're actively testing. I mean, I think we've shown that the, the technology can be used for, uh, for that when, if and when we decide it's, uh, that we want to go down that way. And we're, we're going to test, we're getting some more field testing into at the Atlantic League and the Low A Southeast League down in Florida this year. Um, to get some uh, more repetitions, get some more feedback from the players and the umpires and, um, and just the, the operators on hand who have to, you know, make sure the umpires got an earpiece in to, to hear the call and, um, you know, get some more repetitions in with the system itself and make sure that we've got uh, any of the kinks worked out uh, before it does come to the major league level. Um, so it's, it's something that we, we, you know, take very seriously and are excited to continue to, to see its way through. I wanted to ask a, a talk radio style question. So the, oh boy. give your pitch on uh, you know, why are advanced stats good for baseball? I mean, you can think of the old school argument, you know, we didn't need exit velocity to know Babe Ruth was a good hitter. Uh, sure. People don't like shifting. People don't like the increased strikeouts. So why is this good for the game? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's, it's a great question and one that we spend a lot of time thinking about, frankly. And there's, there's ways that it's not always good for the game, right? Like it, if it induces, uh, if data and analytics induce a style of play that's not very exciting to watch, um, 
you know, that's something that we have to take seriously and we have to be proactive about thinking about how to, uh, to tweak that um, and to try to stay a little bit ahead. So uh, and this is not unique to baseball, of course, but to other sports as well, where uh, you'll see a certain style of, uh, you know, maybe a certain style of play is, is optimal or uh, clubs are incentivized to behave in a certain way or players are incentivized to behave in a certain way that, that is not uh, in line with what the fans want, what, what, what will drive viewers and, um, and uh, ticket sales and attendance. And, uh, and so that's something that, you know, we can use data for good, right? Uh, and we can use it to, you know, going back to a previous question, we can use it to improve the rules and uh, improve the, the fan experience. So we have another question here. This one's from Rudy Guerra. Uh, how do various stakeholders, owners, GMs, players, OMS, et cetera, view analytics, more advanced data, et cetera? Um, it's mixed, and I think it's it's been an evolving and um, generally a positive uh, progression. Really, um, I think when Moneyball first came out, uh, the clubs themselves and the league them itself were were uh, less open to uh, going down this path with data and analytics. Uh, and they've seen, you know, over time how it can be used for uh, to help. Right? Um, you know, they're you know, you could look at any individual team and go from a time when they, they didn't use analytics and they were, they were a little bit more um, old school in, in a sense and, uh, and then watch their progression towards a team that uses analytics and in balance with uh, traditional ways of scouting and, and develop, developing players. And the, the most successful organizations are, are those that can find the right balance and the right harmony between the two. And, and that also goes for players. You know, we're seeing now like the, the newest angle of this revolution is how players can use data to improve themselves, which was something that was overlooked for many, many years. And in fact, there's quotes in Moneyball about, uh, about how player development is really a struggle and how there's, there's not a lot you can do to teach certain things. Well, we're finding now that's not, that's not the case. You can use uh, TrackMan systems or you can use uh, Hawkeye systems or you can use uh, you know, high frame rate biomechanics systems to improve pitcher mechanics or uh, change batter, uh, batter swing plane. Uh, to make them more productive hitters. And I think over time, you know, having the right conduits for that message has been extremely important. Uh, and so the organizations that have found the right people to bring the, to be able to talk, you know, on the same level as the coaches and the players on the field, uh, but also understand the data and how it can be used and applied. Uh, those are the people who have been really successful in, in uh, succeeding with you know, <laughs> successful within organizations at, uh, at blending the two. So we have one more question about the Hawkeye data. And so this, this is a question about the predictive functionality. So can it measure pitch release point and spin to predict if a pitch will be a ball or a strike? Oh, definitely. Um, yeah, it, it's, uh, we, we have um, a pretty scientific approach to modeling the flight of the baseball, right? And, uh, and it's in fact fundamental in, in, into the whole, how the whole system works, right? So, um, in fact, in, in uh, different iterations of the system, uh, depending on how quickly you can get data uh, transmitted and delivered to say a broadcaster, uh, sometimes you, you even have to, you know, the pitch comes out of the hand, you can watch it for a few frames or, or uh, you know, fraction of a second, and then you have to project where it's gonna end up so that you can plot that point on the screen uh, before it actually crosses home plate, right? Uh, so there's, there's, a, there's a good amount of modeling and data science and, and frankly, physics that go into that process of predicting where the ball is going to end up and, uh, and a lot of legitimate use cases for it. Um, so it's a, it's a really interesting scientific process that we, we spend a lot of time on. Thank you, Ben, for the very interesting talk and for uh, entertaining all of these questions. We really appreciate your time. No, thank you. Thanks for having me.